syndicate members it is wednesday we are live from austin texas i'm tony merwin from precision senior marketing i'm here with my good buddy giuseppe good to see you <laughs> that's King what it is you, you had all the hype for that <laughs> good morning good morning it's good to see you buddy how are you well, you know, typically my weekly win is softball, and since you were there last night, I, I am definitely not allowed to use that as my weekly win, but I'm doing yeah. good. Uh, it's Put been a great week, man. Tape. That was a murder scene. It, it kind of was. It was pretty bad. <laughs> was it 27 to 4? They ran over us? Yeah, it was bad. It was uh, it was over yeah, a 20 ball uh, pretty much the entire game. So <laughs> I got to give props to you, though. You went out there in man center field uh, on your opposite hand. <laughs> Yeah, maybe that's my weekly list. It was great. Yeah. It was beautiful. So that was good for you for going out there. So that's awesome, man. It's always good to see you, and that is a fun time. So uh, I enjoyed getting to go out there and hang out with you guys. Um, We we have a really good show today. I'm super excited about this guest. Joe has outdone himself uh, with the guest that we have coming on. Uh, so get excited. This gentleman is about to light light it up. But uh, real quick, just to go ahead and mention it, my weekly win myself um, – it's pretty cool. I got to, I enhanced, I uh, made a real simple adjustment on my marketing, right? Every month we send out uh, business reply card mailers for people that are turning 65 inside of six months. They mail the card back. We call them, we sell them some insurance. It's great. But I made one simple change. We have a nice landing page for an ebook download that we have, kind of your free guide to Medicare, so to speak. All I did was I added a QR code printed on the mailer that sends them to that landing page. And they're scanning it and they're converting on that landing page instead of sending the card back, some of them. So uh, I'm getting leads back 50% quicker because I'm not having to wait for the mail time. They're going right to that landing page and converting. And then uh, theoretically, it should increase my overall lead count. So, and then if that ebook does its job, it's going to edify those leads, increase the contact rate, the closing rate too. So, all in all, it should be a huge win. Uh, But I didn't expect it to happen that quick, right? I just sent out that mailer and all of a sudden leads are popping back in. I'm like, man, that thing just hit the street. Like, why are they already coming back? But pretty cool. <laughs> right. So, I mean, if you're out there sending out BRC cards, like think about that, you know, just drop a QR code on there for a good landing page. Um, you should increase your uh, your total lead count. So pretty good it's thing tough. there. And of course, I use my good buddies over at Lead Concepts for that, which is they are outstanding in the space. Do you do any type of mail marketing like that yourself? Um, I don't. You know, I've I've actually talked um, with one agent who is. Uh, his name is Todd McLean. He runs marketing. He he does it a lot. I've never actually done it myself. Um, well, you know me. Yeah. I'm yeah. so heavy on I'm so heavy on Facebook and social media and stuff. I mean, that's just kind of where I've always kind of lived and and gotten my stuff. So who knows? Maybe in the future. All right. I know you guys obviously do a lot of cold calling too. You had cold calling challenge going out yesterday, I think, with some of your agents. Did you not? Yep. That we did. Yeah. We had um. Just switched up the pace, man. I just turned on some music, got some energy going. I said, we're hitting the phones, baby. First per, or whoever has the most calls, uh, quotes generated count is two calls, a free lunch on me. Um, and so I actually need to take somebody to lunch today. So, <laughs> huh? yeah. Well, all right. Well, yeah. good job leading from the front. Well, let's go ahead and get our guest rolling, man. If you want to introduce this guy, you know him a little better than I do, but uh, yeah. he is a superstar uh, in the industry, in the commercial space, as I understand it. He is. And guys, hey, real quick, before we bring him on, Mr. David Carruthers is about to come and drop some serious freaking knowledge bombs on y'all. Please let StreamYard view your comments. Um, It's the first comment in the live. It's also in the bottom of the description of the actual video itself. Please make sure because we want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, We want to put you guys up on the screen. We just want to know who we're talking with. Um, And we got we got Mitch Gibson on here. So but without further ado, everybody give a very warm welcome um, to my guy, Mr. David. What's up, fellas? Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, man. Thank you for joining us on the show today. My pleasure. Can you hear me good? Yeah, yes, you hear you great. It looks great in there. That is some phenomenal <laughs> looking lighting. I love it. I Occupational hazard. Ambiance lighting going on. That's a pretty <laughs> nice little color you got happening. 
Yeah, you're using your company colors and I'm using mine. So I think we got a common theme going for sure. That's my, the mine is just like, uh, I got an overhead light. I should probably. Yeah, your, uh, yours is like 7 Eleven at 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's that's funny. Right. I have lights too. I have lights in down the hall, and I just I never freaking use them. I should probably start doing that. Uh, that's funny, that's man. Funny. Well, David, um, if you could, man, just give us a little bit um, quick intro. So that's kind of how we like to kick off. Just who are you? Kind of where I know a lot of people already know you that are tuning on to the call, but just kind of give a, a brief synopsis there. Um, and then your weekly win. Yeah, so uh, my name is David Carruthers. I'm agency principal at Florida Risk Partners here in the Tampa, Florida area. It's a agency that I started scratch back in 2016 in the dining room of my home by myself with no help whatsoever and went for about a year and a half without uh, having anybody to help support me grow the agency. So we've grown to uh, be somewhat successful these days in a pretty good size, but I never have forgotten where I come from. So... Mm. Um, it's always important to remember for everybody out there, you know, we all started in the same place for the most part. And I think that what what really separates the people that have a passion for the industry and the passion for helping other people is we we remember what it was like when we didn't have all the answers and when we were starting mm -hmm. out by ourselves. And so yes. um, I try to put out as much content as I possibly can and make sure that, um, you know, I give back 10 times more than I take from the industry. So that's kind of kind of me at a um, high level. You know, I will say that the agency specializes. We're 90%, 98% commercial uh, middle market. I personally try and stay between a quarter and a half million dollars in premium. If I deviate from that, I prefer it to be on the high side. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we my, my agents are pretty much in the... Uh, you know, anywhere from 5,000 to 25,000 in revenue on average is where they're at with some of them moving a little bit upstream now that they've got a few years under their belt. But uh, we hire people from outside the industry. I don't hire insurance industry mm -hmm. talent. I hire business to business salespeople and we train them on our sales process and how we do business and uh, send them off to get their CIC to get the product knowledge. And yep. You know, that's how we, we build them to the same specs every time. We figured out it worked early and we replicate that literally 100% across the board. Um, my weekly win this week is one that's probably close to Joe's heart. I got to take my oldest son with me to the Better Conference yeah. <clears throat> out in Phoenix last week. And that was kind of like me putting the industry on, on notice that next generation's coming and mm. it's going to be way deadlier than the first. So it was just a good time for me to... Um, you know, have him out there and, and showcase, you know, what the industry is about to him. And, you know, the thing that I feel was the best, the biggest win out of all of it was his consistent comment to me was just how nice and how good the people were to him. Mm, yeah. And that's really, really important to me. So that's good. And let's yeah, he so, made a couple of comments about that on Facebook in regards yep. to just, it blows his mind that people from that would normally be competitors, right? Yep. are coming together, collaborating to help, help each other out and lift each other up. 100%. Right. So let's let's backtrack cuz I'm actually curious. What is so when you were sitting at like what what was happening beforehand or what was going on in your mind where you're like, "You know what? I am starting this thing freaking scratch from my dining room table." I want to go back to that moment. Like other than being maybe a little bit crazy, uh what was kind of the like, "Man, this is the fuel to my fire. This is why I'm doing this." Well, I mean, I think that I, I think that for all of us, you know, we make a lot of decisions in life based on emotion more than we do logic. The logical thing would have been for me to do it eight years prior, but I didn't. I was in a toxic situation and I allowed it to fester to the point where I just had to, I had to get out. I had to do my own thing. You know, I wasn't respected. My opinion wasn't respected. I wasn't given the ability to do what I needed to do to control, um, control the team, yet I was expected to grow the team. And I had mm -hmm. two other partners in the agency and we just didn't see eye to eye. And, you know, I did everything I could to make it work. But unfortunately, in the end, it didn't. And so I got pissed off and started Florida Risk. And, you know, the only thing that's going to motivate me more than if I'm passionate about something in a positive way is when I'm operating from an extremely negative place. And that pushes me to go to a deeper, darker level that most aren't willing to go. And I don't say that from an arrogant place. I'm actually not very proud of it. But um, that's that's what it was. I was driven by sheer anger for about the first three years. Wow, man. 
That's powerful, dude. That's good. And then obviously <laughs> fast forward three years where y'all are at now, and maybe that's like a perfect split. So obviously it was Florida risk partners, right? That's where it all started. And obviously you guys have really made that thing a well-oiled machine, but then all the kind of the split offs from Florida risk partners, right? Um, maybe talk a little bit about power, um, power producers, and then we can even maybe get into the protege at the end, but I really, I kind of want this to be as interactive as well. So anybody that's watching, um, if, as David's kind of going through some of this stuff, I'm going to try and not talk as much as possible because David's like just got, he's a freaking wealth of knowledge. If you have any questions or anything like that, like feel free to drop them in here. And like when it's appropriate, we will come back and answer those. We'll put you up on the screen, um, but definitely want this to be as interactive um, as possible, but go for it, David. That's um, I'm super excited to hear everything you're so, about to drop. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, one thing I should probably have said from the very beginning, and I don't joke about this, my biggest, uh, um, my biggest affliction is also my biggest superpower. And that is that I have ADHD at, at a pretty bad level and I don't take my medication for it because I feel like I lose my edge when I do. Mm -hmm. So when I get up and speak in public, I tell people all the time, you know, this is going to be a pretty wild ride because I, I could get all over the place. If I, I, I'm like the guy that if I were an air traffic controller and I had 15 planes to land and I had it had till five o'clock to land them, all 15 of them would land perfectly. But if there was only one plane, and I had to have it landed by five, you better pray to God you're not on that plane because <laughs> it's just not going to happen. So tell, I, I, I missed your question, man. I had it and then you kept going. What was the uh, original question pod, you had? Podcast. So oh, like, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I okay, started I with Florida Risk and then, yeah, you know. Yeah, no, yeah. so I mean, you know, I, I have a, a couple of college degrees, little known fact, me and my good buddy, Scott Howell, were both actually, we are both actually alumni from Birmingham Southern and we were there at the same time and never knew each other. Wow. Which, which is interesting, but... I'm a marketer at heart, man. No matter what I do, I enjoy marketing. I, I you know, I, I've been involved in digital marketing since you know the mid early 2000s when it first started, and have just constantly been a student of that game. I'm not the best, but I'm I'm consistent, you know, and it works if you're consistent. And so, you know, Florida Risk has been successful because we understand that for us to be successful, we never deviate from what we do and we have process for everything involved in sales. And so when I, I got up and spoke at Innovation back in 2020 in San Diego about the hiring process, because my hiring process is actually pretty unique um, and it is born from street smarts and a need to figure out a different way because I didn't have the bankroll to fund bringing in a bunch of producers to scale the agency. And after that was over, I had about 50 agency principals come up to me and, and ask me if I would be willing to work with their agency and teach them what we do, how we do it and all of that. And my answer was unequivocally, absolutely not. <laughs> I have no interest in doing that. You know, my agency is rapidly approaching 3 million in revenue. We're trying to keep the, you know, the wheels on the wagon there. And I've got my own team that I need to support. And then I got on the plane <laughs> to fly five hours back to Tampa and the wheels started spinning. And I'm like, you know what? I've got enough people in the pipeline because I have a pipeline of producers just like I have a pipeline of clients. It's, an eight, it's a 12 to 18 month process to be able to make it into Florida Risk wow. as a commercial producer, which is why we don't lose them, right? We know for a fact they are going to work before they ever come in so I can afford to be patient and have a cue for them. And so... I thought to myself, I really need to get digital because I've got six to eight that I can bring on, but I can't do it the way that I've always done it. I can't hold everybody's hand. Let me figure out how I can digitize this thing. And so as I was thinking through that and what that looked like, I'm like, you know what? I had enough people come up to me. Maybe there's a way for me to monetize this thing and help other agencies, not to get rich and retire off of it, but just to be able to make it worth their while to come in and, and give them information that they otherwise wouldn't. And that's where Killing Commercial came from. Yep. So that was that was the the origin of it. And so as as that happened, I'm think as as I normally would, I want to grow it, obviously. So I'm thinking, what's a good lead magnet for it? Well, let's start a podcast. And so Power Producers actually was originally started to be a lead magnet for killing commercial. I never expected uh -huh. it to grow. And now it's at the point where um, the last time I looked at stats, we were at right around 20,000 downloads a month. So it's taken on a life of its own and doing its own thing at this point. Yeah. Um, specifically the commercial middle market. So, um, you know, that's kind of where that came from. And then Protege just really came from 
the fact that I talked to so many people that wanted to come into Killing Commercial and learn. Maybe they were a producer that was being alienated at the agency they were. Maybe they were a scratch agency owner and they didn't have the money to come in because it's not a cheap it's not a cheap date to get in. But you know you have to have a pain point to get people to do what the what you need them to do, and yep. they get yep. their money back for sure, <laughs> and mm -hmm. then some. But I realized that it couldn't be punitive and I needed to give people a chance. And so that's where I came up with the idea. I thought, you know, what if I take a group of these people that I talked to, or I just put the casting call out for people who would normally kick the tires, but were afraid to and see if they want to work their way in and, and earn it. And so we launched that, put it out there. And I mean, I'll be honest with you, for anybody that's on here listening to this right now, you don't need to come into Killing Commercial. Just go watch Protégé if you want to. You know, if you're, if you're good you're going to figure out that you can connect those dots and you can do do well. The difference is you don't have the accountability, you don't have the social network that we've built and you don't have some of the focused learning, but you know, for those of you that are self-starters, I give you the I give you the blueprint online whether it be YouTube, blog posts or whatever else. I, I like Scott said Scott Howe says a lot of people get want to give you 12 of the 15 ingredients to Aunt B's chili. I give you all 15. <laughs> there you go. So and I have dude, I've got and I I love that, but I have something that I want to because so when Mitch Gibson was on here, you know, he was talking a little bit just about, you know, everything that you guys are or everything that they were being taught and learning through Protege. And so he started talking about mods and stuff like that. And, and to so Tony, if you don't know, Tony's all Medicare, right? So I want to see, David, if you can, in a, in a way that Tony could understand, describe like what a mod is. And I want to see if you can get Tony to understand what, how that works within a business. And again, he's in 100% Medicare because when Mitch was talking about it, it was just kind of like, what the hell is a mod? <laughs> like a credit, it's like a credit score, man. I've never used this analogy before, but I'm trying to figure out something that more people can relate to. It's like your credit score. The, the higher your credit score, the better you get. Uh, it, it sort of works in reverse. The higher your credit score, the better terms you get, the lower, the worse. So the mod is basically just a ratio that says, here's where we expected you to perform based on the size of your account and the class codes you have and the premiums. And here are the losses you actually had. So if your losses are better than what were expected, then you get a credit and you subsequently pay less for your work comp and if your losses were more you get a surcharge and essentially you pay more it's that simple so a lot of people get confused man because when you get a mod a lot they think the goal is one one is never the goal one is average right mm -hmm. so tony so that you understand if if you have a mod of a 1.0 that means you performed exactly like they expected you to perform so when right, they you're do on the ratings, par. yeah when they do the ratings they're going to multiply whatever the slot rates are by the mod and that's going to you know then take some credits off on the back end but that's going to be your premium so mm -hmm. if your mod's a 1.0 you just pay whatever the rates are if your mod's a 0.75 then you're going to get a 25% discount and if it's a 1.25 a 25% surcharge mm -hmm. okay Makes sense. And so a lot of people, especially clients, when you're out there, you know, they'll think that a mod of 1.0 is good. I've had clients where I'll, I've walked in on accounts that are paying a half million dollars in workers' compensation premium with an experienced mod of a 0.86, and they're beating their chest thinking how awesome their mod is. And my first question is, has anybody ever told you how good you could be? Because we have the ability to use software like Mod Advisor to calculate what the minimum mod is. You can actually, for anybody who doesn't know, you can actually calculate the minimum mod uh, directly from the mod worksheet. If you take the stabilizing value and divide it by box K on the mod worksheet, that's the minimum mod. That's the absolute best mod that any company could have um, in, in specific to them because it's coming right off of their mod worksheet. But when you're going out and prospecting with people, a lot of people think you only have to go after the people who have really bad mods. I went in, this guy had a 0.86 on a half million in premium. And I ran the I ran the mod report and, and everything through um, through Mod Advisor and found that his minimum mod was a 0.64. So because this guy thought he was doing good enough, he was leaving 22 points on a half million in the table every year for 100,000 bucks. Wow. Dang. And that's, you know, and I think that even that goes back to highlight <clears throat> your process. And so with your process, you just used it prospecting. I, if you could kind of share, so a lot of, and I know we've got quite a few people that are already in the commercial space. Um, maybe middle market's a little bit scary, right? Maybe they don't want to have to go get the CIC or the CR, all those designations, right? 
But you mean they don't want to understand insurance, Joe? Yeah. Why would they <laughs> right. call this yeah. <laughs> the time? And that's now granted, that's a good point because it's it's a time it's a time commitment, right? And so we've got a few people within Redwood that are doing it, and I, you know, obviously I I respect that. That's that's not where I play, and you know, kind of where we play. Um, but maybe talk a little bit about your prospecting process. Hey, for somebody who is getting this designation or is going through it or is already kind of in an agency that's attacking kind of middle market type stuff, what is some valuable nuggets you could drop on this? And, I, and I've heard it before, but like how you go out and really prospect and, and win accounts. Yeah. So I think the first thing is everybody needs to understand middle market is whatever it is to you. Now, it's not whatever it is to me. Right. What it is to me is I'm in Tampa, Florida, and I can walk out my front door right now and look left and right and see all kinds of accounts that are a quarter million or more in premium because of the geography and the current situation of insurance in Florida. So I'm always very careful to make sure that people understand that when they're talking to me, they need to figure out what that conversion factor is for their own part of the country. So something that's a quarter of a million here in Tampa might be $100,000 in Indianapolis, you know? Mm -hmm. So you have to keep that in mind. But what you also need to remember is that if you have a, a manufacturer that's doing 50 million a year in revenue in Tampa, Florida, and you took that same account and you put it in Indianapolis, it's still a manufacturer that's doing 50 million a year in revenue. And the issue that insurance agents have, and I'm probably gonna piss some people off when I say this, but they'll, they'll understand it's coming from a good place. They're too worried about the insurance, okay? That's it. You need to focus on operations when you're moving up toward the middle market. You need to look for problems in somebody's ops, their hiring process, their training, their development. What kind of return to work program do they have? How's their HR function work? What's the company culture? And if you talk about those things, you're going to be able to build a much better submission for an underwriter than you're ever going to get if you just go in and fill out accord forms with everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the end of the day, when we prospect, we're looking for the sick and the underwriters know we're looking for the sick and they know that we can fix the sick because because we've proven it time and time again. So, you know, what I would tell people is if you're looking to do this and you're going to be an outside producer and you're going to prospect, the first thing you have to do is figure out what you're passionate about and what you know you're good at and what you are having interest in. Because the more interested you are, the more you're going to dive into that industry and the better you're going to serve those people and the more you're going to understand about operations and everything else. If you just go look, let's just say trucking, okay? Because I know that you guys do trucking. There's a lot of big premium in trucking. I don't want anything to do with it. I have a couple of producers that wanted something to do with it. So now we have a trucking division here. But at the end of the day, I'll never touch trucking. I've written a couple of incidental accounts over the course of my career. I just don't like the industry and I'm not going to deal with it. Why? Well, the majority of them are shopping on price because they're used to bidding on loads. And yep. so they're going to come and try and get me to do the same. And I'm not going to abandon point. my value proposition over a price-based sale. It's just never going to work. They'll leave me on price just as quick as they came. I also don't work with car dealerships for the same reason. These are guys that haggle for a living. I don't haggle for a living. You either buy me or you don't. And if you're a car dealership and you're willing to go down that road, I would have the conversation and maybe represent you, but I'm just not going to engage with companies that have competitive bid processes. So what I look for and what I think everybody needs to do and this is Killing Commercial 101, man. You, you have to identify who your ideal prospect is going to be. Yep. And you need to do that across three to five different you know, verticals so that you're not, you're not putting all of your eggs in one basket. You know, there's a lot of people who... <laughs> Who's going to win? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. That's up to the public. I couldn't even tell you right now. I'm still trying to struggle to get them to the top six. But, um, you know, and Mitch has ADD too, so that's a really dirty trick that he, yeah. he just played on me. He knew he was gonna yeah, I should have waited. I should have waited. <laughs> you know, uh. but um, at the end... <laughs> At the end of the day, you got to figure out where you're going to be and not put all your eggs in one basket. So, you know, we, we want producers to think about what they want to make first. So if you say, I want to make $100,000 or $200,000 a year, then work backwards. Figure out what you have to do. How many accounts is that? Okay, well, first you have to identify what the average size of the account is going to be. Then you have to figure out what the parameters are to get to that average size. So for me personally, you know, when I speak, I'll ask who knows their ideal prospect. A lot of people will put their hands up and they're never expecting somebody to call on them from stage. And then when you do, they can't articulate it, right? So I quit doing that because I started embarrassing people. But... 
I can tell you unequivocally that one of my ideal prospects is residential service contractors. I want them to have 25 or more vehicles in their fleet, 40 or more employees. I want them to do 5 million a year or more in sales. And I want their experience mod on the workers' comp to be 1.0 or higher. Why do I want that? Well, because I know I can close all of that, right? Mm -hmm. If I can get in front of them, I've got a really high likelihood of closing the business. But if you go back to what I said originally... I started the agency by myself. So a lot of people are like, why in the world would you want to deal with contractors? Well, number one, they're business to consumers. So there aren't a lot of certificates that need to be pulled for those people. And so I have the ability to use e-certs online and have a self-service portal. As long as it's the pre-approved language, my clients are getting their certificates in real time all day, every day. And we don't have the same service burden because I would never have been able to run an agency out of a dining room. I'd be sitting around issuing certs all the time and not writing new business. Right. The other thing I like about it is the fleet's big enough that I have the ability with some of my carriers to write it on a composite rate. So I'm not having to do vehicles addi vehicle additions and deletions in real time. I can wait until the end of the policy period and get the final count on that. And the other ones, the experience mod being one or higher, I know I'm stacking the deck in my favor of it being one or higher because there's nobody watching over the mod. Okay. Yep. You have yep. Sally housewife that needs her AC put back on. She's not asking for certificates of insurance and an experience mod worksheet to qualify for the job. She's got four kids crying because it's too hot in the house. She just wants somebody out there. So you find that there's an abnormally large amount of people that are in that industry who have mods higher than one because there is no watchdog. And we can go in and we can dissect those accounts because we have such a good process dialed in at this point that it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Like everything else, if you can get the hardest parts, get in the first meeting. If you can get the first meeting, it's over. Like yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't want to sound arrogant, but at the end of the day, we close almost a hundred percent if we can get in front of somebody for the first meeting. Mm -hmm. It's because you've defined the barrel, right? right. You define the, the confines of the barrel, then you put the fish in it. They qualify for it. I love it, and that's this is one of the things I talk about in Medicare, and I'm not going to go to the Medicare space, but I talk about this a lot because <clears throat> I think a lot of agents forget how abundant the insurance industry as a whole is. Even in commercial, even in Medicare, even in annuities, in life, whatever. But it's so abundant that you can create the exact niche market for the exact client, the exact target that you not only feel like you can help best, that stacks your deck, but also, like you said, that you enjoy. You don't enjoy dealing with trucking people. You don't enjoy dealing with car dealerships. You enjoy a very specific niche that's in your space. And I love it because the insurance industry is so abundant that if you really think about it, you can carve out your space and you can sell what you want to who you want, when you want, and where you want. If you're willing to define the parameters and learn how to market to them like you have, then yeah, just like you said, you, you build the barrel, you load in the fish and then just start tackling them. But there's one more, there's one more piece to that, Tony. You can't abandon that. That's where you stay. That's where you live. Right. And the problem uh, that agencies have is, you know, oh, well, I just got this inbound lead for this marketing, this digital marketing company that I can write for, you know, $300 with Hartford. Why in the world will you stop what you're doing to go, you know, write something like that? And so... I feel like, and I was guilty of this, man. I'm talking about this 100% from the point, and that's why I told you guys, I'd never forget where I came from. We get we confuse activity with productivity every single day. Mm. You know, we feel like, oh, I'm busy. I've written 15 policies. Well, guess what? I could go put that same amount of effort or less into writing one of my key accounts, and I'd write, you know, 100 of those other policies worth of revenue in one shot. And, 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 you know, the other thing is cadence. You know, it's a big cadence is a big part of what you do. You have to understand that if you are going to move into middle market and upstream, it's not the same. You know, your sales cycle could be 12 to 18 months instead of, hey, I just called in for a quote. Let me get it bound over the phone or within a day or two, like some, some of the other smaller stuff that you deal with. You have to understand how to plan your days and the activity around that because the issues you run into are you might go three, four, five weeks and not have any activity at all. And then the next thing you know, you have a landslide the next two weeks and you bring in $200,000 in revenue. It's crazy, mm -hmm. but you have to understand that. And that's why it's so important important when we work with producers that they start at the end and work back because agency principles, people, if you own an agency, I'm telling you right now, if you're not doing this way, you're doing it wrong. We monitor results. We don't monitor behaviors. And that's a problem because results are the end. We can be monitoring behaviors in real time and holding people accountable to those, knowing that if they're following the plan that's been proven to work across the board, the results are automatically going to come.
monitor the behaviors, support your people, find out what's going on. You can tell me every single week whether a producer has made their marketing drops, their telephone calls, their emails, and everything they need to do. Why would you wait to the end of a quarter to say, hey, you didn't hit your numbers? It doesn't make any sense. And the other thing is, if you do get to the end of the quarter and that person hasn't hit their numbers, you can objectively go back and say, look, you've done everything I've asked you to do. Your behaviors are on point. You might not have hit your numbers here, but you weren't off by that much. I bet you overachieved next quarter. And I'm willing to bet it happens almost every time. And is that so? And I guess that kind of goes back to, I guess to kind of tie it together is, um, and then I have one other question because you very you just recently mentioned it, and I'm going to come back to it. But is that why you're not bringing people in from um, the insurance industry? You're you're bringing them in from outside because of maybe potential bad habits where they they do confuse the activity with that. Like so, is that maybe why, or is it kind of you had another reason as to why you were doing that? No, I think that part of the issue is you have it, it, you either have really good salespeople or really good insurance technicians, but the hybrid is where I live. I want both. And that's tough. You have to manufacture that themselves yourself. Most of the time, if you have an insurance technician that's out on a sales call, they talk themselves out of business because they want everybody to understand the intricacies of the policies. I'm going to make a controversial statement. Your clients don't care. They don't care about the coverage. They really don't. We because talk about here's, this is SWAT, right, yeah. Joe? Yeah. yeah, here's here's what I know. If there's five agents that are pitching an account and you all have licenses, you can all place insurance and you look the same to them. Your job is to make yourself uncommon in a common environment. That's why I go and focus on the risk management side of things because people are going to automatically assume that if I have a license and I called them that I know what I'm doing on the insurance side. So if I can go in and talk about risk management, HR, and all of the other things, I sell that. I sell that value proposition. I sell the fact that we have a mobile app, that we have a certificate portal, that we could create a customized risk management intranet for every one of our middle market accounts. And I go right down the line. And then when we get to the end, you know, I'll tell them, look, I could charge you for all of this stuff that we talked about today, or I could show you how you you can use money that you're already spending to buy my value proposition. We don't view insurance is the transaction. We view insurance as the funding mechanism to buy our value proposition. You have to have insurance. You're already spending money on it. You're just not getting this. And that's Mm -hmm. what your results reflect. So the reason I bring people in from the outside is because I like people from ADP, Paychecks, all of these other places that get Fortune 500 quality sales training before they ever walk in my front door. And I don't have to spend any time on that. If you if I look at a resume and somebody's been at ADP for five years, they're hired. I don't have to look at anything else on their resume. It doesn't matter. Because if you lasted in that environment for five years, this is a cakewalk for you. Hmm. That's good. That's good. And then so let's okay. So then this is a perfect and and Ryan, I'm about to uh, Ryan England, I'm about to put your uh, comment up. And this will be kind of if you can try and knock out both here on this, David. So um, to go back to, hey, the hardest part is that, that first meeting, right? But if man, if I get that first meeting, it's game over, baby. I'm I'm winning it, right? And so maybe highlight a few things that you're doing. And I think you just, hey, calls, marketing drops, all those types of things. And I know that obviously you've said it a lot, but what are maybe some things that you're doing that separate yourself to even get in the door before you really go in and and pitch that value prop and then maybe kind of close out with what Ryan's asking about Think HR. Um, But again, just getting in the door. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the places that we make mistakes is that we grasp one thing that's worked for us before and then that becomes our marketing plan, right? We don't have just one thing. We've probably got about eight different things, whether it be brand awareness or engagement or whatever else that we're doing. So it's not, it's never just one trick to get in, in the door. Um, you know, one of the things that we did this year that's pretty unique, I think, is I decided when COVID hit back at the beginning of 21 that I needed to diversify a little bit. One of the problems in Again, like I said, I'll give you guys all 15 ingredients. It sounds sexy to say that you have a $4 million middle market agency, but the problem is, you know, you lose those accounts, it hurts, you know, mm-hmm. you lose it. And so part of the issue that I ran into in late 2020 and early 2021 was I lost a quarter million in revenue out of my personal book because venture capital bought service contractors. Okay. Uh, And so there's nothing I can do to save those other than now I have a meeting with the CFO of the VC company to try and take the whole portfolio. But there's nothing you can do to protect that. And what that highlighted was we have a very unique problem in our agency in that our average revenue per account is too high. And that sounds like it's sort of a passive aggressive way for me to brag. I can assure you people, 
that's not a brag. That's me losing sleep at night because we have a problem. And so when we brought auto owners in, they told us we want you to be between 25 and 100,000 in premium, not the revenue thresholds that you're at. And so I used to have a $5,000 minimum on revenue for the agency. And I wiped that out with COVID because we had carriers like Amtrust that were coming in and giving us 22 points on new business for workers comp. And we could sell it over the phone or over Zoom all day. So... Mm -hmm. We started changing a little bit because we weren't able to go out and do the in-person drops and stuff like that. And the the unique thing that I did was I brought in a VA and I went to him. I used the same model that I use when I bring people in. And I told the VA company, I don't want any experience in calling. I don't want any experience in insurance. And the only thing that I ask is that the accent is light. I can't have Tom from Microsoft support calling and asking for appointments. Okay. It's just not going to work. So we, we, we got that. We dialed it in and here's, here's something novel calling and asking for the appointment works, (laughs) right? Calling and asking for the appointment works. I could give you every sexy script I've ever written, but at the end of the day, our constituency learns how to buy insurance from us. There's no college course that says, here's how to procure insurance for your middle market business. They learn from the agents and the agent's behavior. And we have trained them that 60 to 90 days before renewal is when we're going to call. That's not how I like to do it. I like to engage a month after they renewed so that I have a head start. And for my larger middle market accounts, we do that. But when 2021 hit, We put the VA in and we go to the Florida Department of Financial Services website and we download every single workers' comp policy in the five counties surrounding the Tampa Bay area. We upload it into HubSpot. And now Marvin, our VA, has a... By the way, I I know like five people who have VAs called Marvin. That's got to be like some alias that they just have. (laughs) It's actually all the same VA. (laughs) Yeah, probably is, man, the way this joker works. But essentially, we we just gave Marvin a very simple script that says, hey, we know your workers' comp renewal is coming up on such and such date. And this is when you're typically getting calls. We would really like to be considered this year. Would love to meet with you. Kyle's going to be able to talk to you next Tuesday or Wednesday. Which one's better? Great. He's got times in the morning or afternoon. Which one's better? And oh, afternoon, great. Is two or three better for you? And that's it. And what we found is that taking a VA with no calling experience, no insurance experience, left no bias whatsoever. All he knows is his job is to get as many calls in and as many appointments as he can a day. And so this clown's getting like five to 25 appointments a week, just calling and asking for the appointment for us. And we're converting at an insane rate. We've paid for him at this point for the next nine years, just on the amount of business that we've generated from it. So I think that we get so concerned about having these ridiculous marketing campaigns that are showy and flashy and are going to get people's attention when at the end of the day, all you got to do is ask for the order. Yeah. Mm. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Simplify it. You got anything? I saw you. I've, saw, I've seen you taking some notes there, Mr. Merwin. Yeah. What yeah. I've been jamming down some notes. That was one thing he said. And I was going to close with it. And I don't want to close early, but uh, you made a comment while you were at a better agency or better what a better conference. I apologize. I know it was something of that effect, but uh, you made a specific comment that uh, the next generation is here and it is even deadlier than the previous. Yep. I'd love for you to expand on that some. Well, I think we have a problem as agency principals. I'm kind of a tweener, right? So Joe's, I would consider Joe the next generation and there's a generation ahead of me and I'm kind of sandwiched in the middle, which is an interesting place for me to be. You know, I'm from the generation where when I started college, there was no internet. I watched the internet get built. There was no Facebook. I watched Facebook get built. So I, I think that I actually have an advantage over a lot of the younger generation just because they, this stuff, a lot of things existed when they came into the world and I watched the trend that led to that stuff being constructed, Mm. I have an advantage over the older generation because they just don't care. Like they're not interested in, by and large, I realize I'm making a a generalization here, but the overwhelming majority don't. They're still sending out Courier and Ives calendars at Christmas every year, right? So they're not worried about technology and drip campaigns and all of that other stuff. Now, unfortunately, what what that has led to is a situation where they focus more on control than they do collaboration. And they're not willing to listen to that next generation. They're not understanding that Snapchat and Instagram and all these other things that are coming out now are going to be the way business is marketed and done in the future. And so rather than embracing that and learning... They just push it away and it's affecting their valuation, their ability to be acquired. And ultimately, there's not really going to be a good success.
succession plan because that talent mm -hmm. is going to leave and go somewhere else just like I did. So I'm always going to be open. I'm not going to adopt every single idea somebody says, but you know, I think agency principals need to start listening because the people that you're not listening to are the people that are going to be buying from you in five years. Right, right. No, man, well that's, you know, and I think... You know, you just said it too, because it's about valuation in, in the like, hey, if you're ever really big picture, right? And I think sometimes we get so kind of tunnel vision that you're not thinking like, man, dude, nobody's going to want your agency. And I know this is this is maybe not necessarily the same thing, but nobody's going to want your agency, even if it is a freaking amazing, like crazy revenue, if you're working off Excel sheets, right? Or yeah. maybe you don't even have, like, I know people that still work off paper and I, Tony, you do too. And I'm like, but in the big picture, if you ever do get to the point of time, now granted, that's not necessarily my mission. You know, my mission, I want to have a hundred year agency, right? But that that's my mission, right? And I think a lot of agents get in this to, you know, create that, that lasting legacy. And that's, but, you know, and I think also, what comes like, and I am that kind of that lower, that generation. But I think where I've really been able to win is like, dude, when David Carruthers or a Tony Merwin or somebody who has been in this way longer than me is talking, you shut up. Right. And I think that's the one issue I see with some of these younger agents, they come in and yeah, Hey, maybe you work really hard and you grip it and you rip it. But there are certain things that we need to be, we need to be listening to, but that's why I love, and, and David, that's why I wanted you on the call in the first place. You know, you're you're dropping so much gold, like in because hey, I've been doing this and I've been doing this, and you're giving away the farm, right? You're giving away all 15 pieces of the or ingredients of the recipe. And and that is what's creating the next generation, right? And I love that you got to take your son to that. I love, I can't wait till I get to take my daughters to stuff with me and just and expose them not only to to this amazing industry, right? That has not definitely changed my life, but is indirectly, I mean, 100% impacting their lives, right? And I know, I'm sure your son is feeling that. Um, wherein, you know, from what, 2018 to, to now, right? Is that when you started at the, at the 20, kitchen table? 20, yeah, 2016. 2016, so it's 26 like... 26 this year, yeah. Man, and that's, I mean, and that's amazing, but I think also how you conduct business, right? And I think that's a big thing for us as well, right? We come in and we we just try and grip it. Like we're gripping it and ripping it, right? We're just go, 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 go. But it really comes down to caring about the client as well, right? And I think that's where you've been able to, to really separate yourself, but then also your son gets to see all that, right? He gets to see this is what happens when you freaking take care of people, right? And so I just, I wanted to highlight some of that because, you know, again, for us as, a, as an upcoming generation, as the new wave of insurance agent is kind of, coming out, right? Um, you know, it's, there are certain things that we need to be adapting, but then there's also certain things that we need to be listening to, whether it be each side, right? And you kind of touched no, on I, that. I agree. I mean, I think, you know, part of the reason, if I were to look at how I've been able to create the culture that we have, it has a lot to do with my home life and the fact that I have four kids, which requires a certain amount of patience in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But if you take it a step further, my youngest son has special needs. He's got some fairly significant neurological issues. He'll, he's a lifer. He'll never be able to care for himself. And as a result of that, that creates a level of patience that tells me that if I can deal with that, there's nothing in the professional world I can't deal with. And so my demeanor has changed over the years, man. I was nasty in my early 20s. Like you wanted no piece of this action. I would fire my own mother with ice water running through my veins when I was running grocery stores back in the day. And a couple of years ago, one of my best friends was was a co-manager for me in one of the stores that I ran. And he came down to visit. And he watched how I was operating with my kids. And he looked at me. He goes, what the heck happened to you, man? You got soft in your old age. I can't believe it's even the same guy. you know. And I think that we grow and we adapt. And, and we have to be willing to do that, right? It starts with a willingness. If you're an agency principal... And you just pencil whip that and give it lip service and say, yeah, I'm willing to listen to what you have to say. And then every time something comes out of the younger generation's mouth, you're the first one to tell them, you know, the, correct them or tell them why it won't work. What are you really doing? You're actually doing more damage than good. You'd have been better off just keeping your mouth shut and ignoring them instead of squashing their entrepreneurial spirit. So... You know, that's the deal. You know, I think that that it is. It's got to be that the younger generation is willing to um, listen, and the older generation needs to be willing to listen. You know, and it, it's no different than the sales game. You learn way more by listening than you ever will by yep. talking. Yes. To answer Ryan's question real quick, um, Mineral, which used to be Think HR, 
is one of the ways that we lead. Um, you know, I, again, this is somewhat controversial because I don't think that, look, agents are cheap, man. Agency principles are cheap. They don't like to spend money. They don't like to give things away. Think HR. I'm going to call it Think HR. It's called Mineral now, but I, it's always been Think HR to me. Um, you know, it's ten thousand dollars a year for us to have that in the agency. Not an overly huge bill relative to volume and everything, but it's still a, a big nugget. We give it to everybody. Everybody. I don't care if you're a client or a prospect. Either way, we're going to give it to you. Now, if you're a prospect, I'm going to give it to you for free for ninety days. I'm going to let you go in. We're going to encourage you to create the online handbook that updates in real time. We're going to help you. I've got a full time employee that does nothing except interface our technology with our clients. Why? Because that's how we win. You know, it's an expensive investment to make, but when you get the revenue from the accounts because people are actually using the toys that you buy. It makes everything work much better. So we get them to create a couple of uh, courses inside the digital learning system in Think HR, and we monitor their behaviors through the reports that we get. And at 90 days, we'll go out and have a conversation and tell them, look, you know, we, we, we noticed you've been using it. How's the tool working for you? And they're going to tell us that it works great. They love using it. We already know that because we get the utilization reports. Then I'll tell them I have some bad news. Unfortunately, the 90-day trial period is over. Um, you know, if you'd like to continue using the product, we can let you do it for $5,000 a year if you pay annually, or we can sell it to you for $500 a month, which would be $6,000 a year. What do you think about that? And if we don't get a positive response, we say, well, what if we told you you can use money you're already spending and get Think HR at no additional cost like all of our clients get? And now all of a sudden we can have the conversation and bring the insurance relationship over and give them the value proposition we let them test drive. Now, I, in my peer group, people are going to say, why in the world would you give it to them? Well, I just told you why I gave it to them. We write business because we give it to them. I can pay $10,000 a year for Think HR and give it to nobody. What am I going to get out of it? Who do, what do I care if I give it to prospects? Right. 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 I'm going to pay ten grand a year regardless. I'd like to get a return on that money. Absolutely. Man, that's that's freaking good, man. And that's, I mean, you know, and I think you you hit the nail on the head. And I love, and we're going to respect everybody's time here, guys. And and this has probably been one of our best calls, definitely one of our highest attendance calls that we've had here on Winning on Wednesday. So I appreciate you taking the time, David. I know that you're super busy, man. But I wanted to, our the real quick highlight, and then Tony, you can take us out. It's an investment versus an expense mindset, right? And that was something that, you know, and, I, and I'm super gracious that I was able to kind of figure that out at a younger age. And, and it took definitely some, some hard work, right? But when you stop thinking about everything as an expense, it's like, oh man, I'm just spending. It's an investment, not only for your, the Your clients, electric right? bill is an expense. Your internet right. cost is an expense. Your CRM is not an expense. It's an investment. Your, mm -hmm. you know, tools like Think HR and Mod Advisor, those are all part, those are all investments that are going to return dollars to you. And guess what? You should be measuring that, right? You should be looking in your CRM and coding. What got the deal done? Was it Think HR? Was it Mod Advisor? Was it, you know, the website? What what, what actually made this happen? And, you know, at the end of the day, that's it. That's good. That's good. Beautiful. That's so good. I just want to take, I, I do want to close up here because we try to keep this under an hour and respect everybody's time, but I do want to take an extra two minutes real quick. That's cool. Just to talk about your book. There you go. So you, uh, one, Dan, years I got ago, another you wrote one. a book. I uh, got a new well, one coming I out. I know of one. I only know of one yeah. called The Extra Two Minutes. So if you wouldn't mind taking an extra two minutes and tell us about that book, why you wrote it, kind of what it's about and why an agent should go pick it up. Yeah, so I think everything in life is defined by who's willing to just take it to one level more than everybody else is. And I'm willing to bet that if anybody has had any interaction with me outside of just the internet, in person, client, podcast guest, right? Whoever, they're going to say that we have done everything we could possibly do to make that person feel the most special of anybody else. I love it. If I wasn't in insurance, I would be a concierge at a Ritz Carlton because I love hooking people up and giving them the greatest experience that they possibly could have. And I, I look at it like this. You could go stay at the Ritz Carlton or you could stay at Motel 6. 
Fundamentally, they're the same thing. You walk in, you check in, you sleep overnight, you check out and you go home. What separates those two is the experience you get when you go to the Ritz Carlton. When you check in, they call you by name. They have water ready. That you know, It is just white glove service. And when I formed my agency, I wanted it to mirror that service model. So the extra two minutes is basically me chronicling a lot of the stuff that I've done over the course of my career to win opportunities by going that extra mile and sharing it with everybody because it's nothing that's rocket science. It's something everybody has the ability to do and they can create their own version of it. They just have to be willing to do it. Now, quickly, the second book, which will be out next month, it got delayed because I had some surgery I had to have, so it held me up from writing it, is called The Dirty 130. And that goes back to behavioral based. That that is a 130 day challenge, uh, six months of work days of you dialing in your behaviors. We talk about how you identify what they need to be, how you plan them. And it'll, it's coming out with a companion journal that you can use to record that stuff. And it's going to be across the board, mind, body, spirit, not just we're going to go out and sell insurance. It's you making you a better person and exhibiting the behaviors you need to have to ultimately be a successful producer. And it's going to be applicable to any industry. It's not limited to insurance at this point. So that's why I'm so passionate about the behavior piece and monitoring behaviors because behavior breeds results. And if you're not monitoring the behavior, you're not going to get the results either way. Beautiful. Yep. Well said, man. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I'm definitely getting a copy of that book, probably a, a few copies of it, the, the extra two minutes. Because I believe anybody, that too. Hey, believe anybody on you. here, anybody on here, hit me up on a DM on Facebook. I will sign a copy and mail it to you. Done. Legend. Legend. Don't even, don't even have to pay for it. I've got a box of them sitting here. That's awesome. Cool, cool. We'll make sure we have his Facebook link or something in there where everybody can find him. I'll go in and drop easily. It. But yeah, DM him and he'll sign a book and send it out to you guys. That's awesome. Well, David, thank you again for coming on. Joe, thanks for putting this together. Yep. It has been an outstanding uh, winning on Wednesday. I mean, this has definitely been our highest attendance. So uh, thank you again. We want to bring you back on, I'm sure, at some point in the future and pick your brain some more. But uh, thank you again, guys. Thanks for tuning in. We are out and we will see you next Wednesday, 9 a.m. sharp. Live from this the is, syndicate. This is the this is the peace out from the 7-Eleven at, at 3 a.m. Guys, <laughs> go win go win some accounts, baby. Let's go go win. Hey, man, as, yes. long as, that, as long as that Slurpee machine's working, we're yeah, good. right. <laughs> Absolutely, y'all have a great Wednesday and an awesome week, everybody. Thanks, syndicate members.